Welcome everyone. My name is Gloria Matera. Currently I'm the co-chair of the Green Party of New York State and a representative from my state to the National Green Party. Uh, I've been a candidate before. Um, I've worked on campaigns. Recently deputy campaign manager for Stein Baraka campaign. Uh, I've worked in public health in this city for over 20 years. So I've had a big reality check. Today we're going to hear from uh, four speakers. I'm going to tell you who they are quickly, and then they will, uh, in the order in which they will speak, so people know that. Um, I also want to say quickly that I am one of the steering committee members of a group called Left Elect, which I'll talk a little bit about later. We'll have someone say a few words about that, but uh, primarily when we had our founding convention in 2015, uh, one of our kind of main goals was to create a dialogue for those who are committed to left electoral politics outside of the two-party system. And you'll hear, I think, a lot about that today. Um, so our speakers, in order of they coming up, it will be, uh, sorry, I need my glasses for this. Chris Hedges, uh, who's an author and critic and was a foreign correspondent for nearly two decades for a variety of uh, news outlets. Uh, his most recent book, Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt, uh, will fit in very well here. Um, and he writes online column for Truth Dig. Uh, after Chris, we will have Medea Benjamin, uh, the co-founder of the women-led peace group Code Pink and the co-founder of the human rights group Global Exchange. Uh, and just to put a plug in for Medea's newest book, Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Then uh, Dr. Jill Stein, uh, who recently was the 2016 Green Party presidential candidate, also the candidate in 2012, a physician and an environmental activist uh, for many years. And then joining us right after she finishes another panel uh, for our fourth speaker will be Margaret Kimberly. Uh, Margaret's Freedom Writer column appears weekly in Black Agenda Report and is widely reprinted elsewhere. She maintains a frequently updated blog as well at um, http slash freedomwriter.blogspot.com. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thank you. I, I want to use my 15 minutes to kind of lay out where we are politically. Um, Trump is the symptom, he is not the disease. He is what has been vomited up by a dysfunctional political system that long ago ceased to be democratic and is best characterized in the words of the political philosopher Sheldon Wolin as a system of inverted totalitarianism. This is a phrase anyone who's read or heard me speak knows that I use to characterize the system of power. In short, inverted totalitarianism is different from classical forms of totalitarianism uh, in that it is built around the anonymity of the corporate state. It doesn't overthrow a system and replace its symbols and iconography, but presents itself as paying fealty to electoral politics the Constitution, the iconography and language of American patriotism, yet internally has seized all of the levers of power to render the citizen impotent. And that's where we are. And that's where we have been, uh, I think at this point, arguably for 30 years. Uh, certainly we can go back to Reagan, but it really was accelerated under the Clinton administration uh, with the destruction of the liberal elite and the liberal class. Uh, and I wrote a long book on this called The Death of the Liberal Class. Uh, but you saw a transformation uh, of uh, our liberal establishment. Remember Chomsky, uh, I think, has given us the best definition not only of how empire works, but how a liberal class in a capitalist democracy works. It works as a kind of safety valve uh, to ameliorate uh, the uh, most grotesque grievances and injustices under capitalism. This is what we saw with the New Deal. Uh, and so you can... Uh, and as Roosevelt said, Roosevelt was quite frank that his greatest achievement was he saved capitalism. He, that's what the liberal class does from pressure from radical movements. Um, and then, 
all, many of you, of course, have read Howard Zinn's great work, The People's History of the United States. Um, that work is a brilliant piece of history on many levels, but one of the most important aspects of that book is that it highlights how undemocratic the American system was when it was created uh, and how movements, radical movements, were the forces that opened up that space. Uh, so in the name of anti-communism, uh, certainly accelerated uh, after the 1950s, those radical movements were destroyed. Uh, the fact that uh, within the Democratic Party, and I would even have to call out Bernie Sanders, uh, no one will challenge uh, the military state, Seymour Melman at Columbia, another great scholar, go, he's an economist, read his books on what the military establishment has done to the domestic economy and to the state. Um, one of the many examples he cites is that, for instance, New York City several years ago wanted to buy uh, subway cars. Nobody makes subway cars because they're all making tanks because your cost overruns are covered. They had to buy them from Japan. Um, and so nobody will confront that military complex, which at, at the end of empire, we are certainly at the end of empire. I studied classics uh, at Harvard and the, the, it resonates. I mean, Trump is commodus, if anybody knows the end of empire. Uh, the, the guy who had no interest in governing and whose vanity and ego, he's the one who like would fix fights in the arena. I mean, just completely out of Trump. Um, uh, they strangled him in his bath eventually. Um, <laughs> and what happened after is that you saw uh, uh, a, uh, an, a reformist emperor, I don't want to you know, make this too cute, but a kind of Bernie Sanders who wanted to take on the military power and they, they assassinated him after three months and then the Praetorian Guard just decided that they would give out the emperorship to the highest bidder. That's kind of where we are. Um, we, we, we have had, uh, certainly for the last 30 years, a naked, uh, not a naked, but, a, but a, a, a powerful uh, corporate kleptocracy. Uh, and, uh, and this is the, the great damage that Bill Clinton did uh, by continuing to speak in that kind of feel your pain language of liberalism and purportedly supporting liberal values, inclusivity, all that kind of stuff, while selling out, oh, beginning with NAFTA, the FCC, welfare, of course, and seven, every time I heard Hillary Clinton talk about women and children, I would think about the, how she, first they started as a template in Arkansas and then moved on to the federal government, how they sold out, uh, you know, single mothers with children. Seventy percent of the original recipients under the welfare program that Bill Clinton killed were children. And, and so what happened? We created a system, and I covered the war in Yugoslavia. I find many, many echoes of Yugoslavia here. It was more extreme at the end of the 1980s because you had a complete collapse. It was deindustrialization, but a clique and hyperinflation like Weimar. But, but there was an article today, for instance, on the front page of the New York Times that's worth reading about the uh, violent alt-right, the alt-knights and these groups. And I just came from Portland. I was in actually speaking in Portland when uh, these uh, two people were killed and the third was seriously wounded in this hate crime. Um, but I don't take this lightly because I watched exactly the same thing happen in Yugoslavia. Most Yugoslavs did not want their country to be rent apart by violent conflict. Uh, but what happens is that the longer paralysis continues, and that's essentially what, what, what we're in. We're in a state of of, of stasis, in a, there's no movement. And uh, the, uh, the, the deep state has crippled even Trump. Uh, I, I have obviously find Trump as repugnant. I mean, he's like something coughed up out of the Grand Guignol. Um, <laughs> but he, he, the whole kind of framing of this as that he's a stooge of Russia, or that Russia was the one that spun the elections is an absurdity um, when you think about it, when you parse it. And let, let me throw in for, uh, because I did hear this kind of talk at the left forum in the past, it is as absurd as the idea that Ralph Nader elected George W. Bush. Um, So look at, look at what, what they're saying. What, and, and of course, it's just bom the media is just bombarding you from the repugnant Rachel Maddow on down. Uh, the idea that 
that that that I guess tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of Hillary Clinton supporters woke up one morning and read the John Podesta emails and said, that's it, I'm voting for Donald Trump. That's kind of what they're telling you. Or if you read the seven pages in the Director of National Intelligence report dedicated to RT America, where I have a show, um, and they, the, the, uh, the power of RT America, which let's be frank, no one watches, uh, convinced massive numbers of Americans to vote for the Green Party. That's really it. And it is as demagogic or demagogic as what Trump is doing towards Muslims, and, but it's demagoguery from the liberal elites. And it doesn't face the fundamental reality. The reason the Democratic Party got shellacked, and not just in the presidential election, is because they betrayed working men and women. They thrust a knife into the back of the working class. And you know, if I hear one more time about the Clintons being a friend of African Americans, I teach, I, I teach in a prison, and I can tell you 80% of my students wouldn't be there but for Bill, Clint, Bill and Hillary Clinton. No, I'm not joking. Seriously, the 1994 omnibus crime bill, what did it do? It exploded the prison population. I was up visiting Mumia Abu Jamal, that our great revolutionary, one of the most courageous figures in America. And one of our most important intellectuals. And he was looking around the room going, you know, none of these people would be here but for the Clintons. And, uh, and that selling out came with an ideological, uh, a, a kind of, a, a use of traditional liberal terms that became inverted. So for instance, <coughs> what did a post-racial America become? It became about a, a black president who was Cornel West served as a black mascot for Wall Street. What does feminism be, what does feminism become? I mean, I come, I come out of Andrea Dworkin, uh, who is a feminist for me, and a real one, and, and Dworkin said that feminism is about empowering oppressed women. It is not about a woman CEO or a woman president. And, 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 and what's happened, and this, I just, I just finished teaching, a, semester at Princeton, what's happened in the universities and in the liberal elites if they have totally bought this mantra that, that we will color code elitist institutions. Meanwhile, poor people of color and uh, the working class and uh, will, will be thrown under the bus. And that's precisely what's happened. I just want to end by talking a little bit about the white working class, which has a line behind Trump which is uh, angry, racist, xenophobic, all of these things are true. However, the pain of the white working class is real and it's legitimate. And we are going to have to uh, begin to build bridges uh, to people who think differently than us and perhaps even say things that we disagree with. Uh, I come from rural Maine. Um, and I can assure you many of my relatives, who I love very much, had, there were things that came out of their mouth that were highly inappropriate. Um, they were poor, lower class workers. And my rule was, you can say whatever you want when you go home, but you can't say that in front of me. But I still love you and I care about you. And uh, we have to, and I think Nader has been pushing this and Nader is right, we have to begin to organize and, and we're going to have to build, we're going to have to align ourselves or build movements because at this point uh, I, I think it's good that we, you know, run a Green Party candidate, I'm all for it, but I think at this point it is, uh, I just gave a talk on Gramsci last night, it is kind of like Gramsci trying to organize the Communist Party under Mussolini's fascism. They put so many roadblocks in that it's, um, Trotsky actually writes a lament for Gramsci for trying to do this. Um, and, and I think that we're going to have to begin to find our strength by building a consensus around uh, issues that people care about within their communities that are, that are in many ways seen as apolitical but are not apolitical. That is raising the minimum wage. That is blocking fracking from destroying your water system. That is stopping Betsy DeVos from destroying your public school. Uh, and it is going to come through acts of 
mass civil disobedience. And there's Ralph Pointer, who's led the life we should all lead, doing it. I don't think you ever got arrested for resisting arrest. I think you got arrested for assaulting police officers. Am I right about that, Ralph? <laughs> Not the same thing. Don't, don't believe that. That guy was a boxer in Pittsburgh. So, uh, uh, but, but I think that's it. And, and I, I, uh, I, I, you know, they're, they're going to get nasty and they're going to get rough because the Democratic Party is not going to change. Um, they are wedded, I mean Schumer, I mean Schumer as an alternative, the, ba the bag man for Wall Street, for the Democratic Party. Uh, and, uh, and we saw with the 200 protesters at the inauguration, um, they are going to come down. We saw it with the br brave water uh, uh, resistors and water defenders and Standing Rock. Um, it's going to be dirty and it's going to be ugly, but it's the fight of our lives uh, because, frankly, if we don't change this system uh, as a species, we're not going to be here. Thank you. So I want to follow up on a number of the things that Chris brought up. And when we're looking at do we need a new party or can we work within the system, I just want to talk a bit from experience. I moved to Washington, D.C. about 10 years ago because Barack Obama got into office and I thought, now we can really change things. <laughs> Laughter. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of us have tried really hard, and certainly there were some things that changed. Uh, on the international level, I think a great win was the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, and that's something that we should really be fighting hard to keep in place. Uh, on the international level, there was also the opening with Cuba, which is something that was decades in coming too late, but came finally, not, not enough. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, it was business as usual. And for um, the work that I was doing, it was so disheartening to see the way that the Democrats work so hard to prop up the empire. When you did, I, I wrote this book recently on Saudi Arabia because, uh, you know why I did it actually? <laughs> because every year I would go out to APAC, the Israel lobby, and we would be out there fighting with these people going to, into APAC, literally getting beaten up every single year by the people going into APAC and the police would never protect us. Uh, and the, I'm Jewish, so other you know, Jewish people going into APAC would say, why don't you do something about those Arab regimes? Why are you always picking on Israel? So I thought, all right, maybe there's some truth to that. you know. And I started researching and doing work around Saudi Arabia. And it was amazing to me to find that not only has the US since the 1930s, the time that the Saudi empire was created, been supporting this regime, but it was really under Obama that they became the number one purchaser of US weapons under Obama. 42 separate weapons deals under Obama. Did the Republicans say, oh, why are we giving to this horrible, you know, Arab Wahhabist, intolerant, misogynist regime that's spreading terrorism around the world? No, they were all for weapon sales. Did the progressive Democrats stand up and say, why are we giving to this misogynist, intolerant, blah, blah, blah? Not at all. Uh, and so you saw both parties doing the most unthinkable thing if you really want national security for the, uh, the United States, which is supporting the very country that was spreading extremist ideology that forms the foundation of ISIS and Al Qaeda. And so even today when Trump goes to Saudi Arabia and all of a sudden some Democrats are saying, ooh, what's he doing selling all these weapons to the Saudis? But the majority of them in Congress, you know, they have the right 30 days after weapons deal is announced to stand up and say no to that deal. You know how hard it is for us to get even the majority of the progressive caucus in Congress to say no to weapons sales to Saudi Arabia because not only is it supporting this repressive regime internally, but because they're using the weapons to decimate the people of Yemen. Absolute catastrophe what's going on in Yemen. And we can't even get the majority of progressive Democrats to say no. Now that is shameful. That is absolutely unacceptable. 
and I want to give another example, and I see my uh, comrade here, Arielle Gold from Code Pink, who does our Israel-Palestine work, because she is braving going into Congress to try to get them to do the simplest thing that you can imagine. You know, there's the whole thing, progressive and everything but Palestine. Well, you know, it's... Well, you, you can't find people in Congress who are good on Palestine. And she had to work from May until, from October of last year until May, to get one person in Congress to stand up and say they would initiate a letter. It's just a letter, it's not even a bill, saying that the Gandhi of Palestine, Isa Amro, known as the Gandhi of Palestine because he is supportive and and definitive about using nonviolent tactics. He has been given awards around the world. He's recognized by the European Union. He's brought here actually by the State Department. Uh, he says uh, he is facing 19, 18 charges uh, in a military court that has over 99% conviction rate. And we are trying to get somebody in Congress to stand up and say to Tillerson, maybe the, the Israelis should reconsider this. That's what they're asking for. It took months to get somebody to do it. And our goal is to get 25 members of Congress, 25. You know how many members of Congress we have, right? 435. We want to get just 25 to sign on to this letter. And that will be an incredible victory if we get those 25. That's how pathetic it is. That's how horrible it is. That's how awful these Democrats are. And so, of course, we need a new party. Of course we need a new party. Now, the question and the discussion, I think, is what is that party? Is it the Green Party? And we certainly have a fabulous representative of the Green Party right here in Jill Stein. Is it another party, a new party? It is, is it a coalition of parties? I don't know. I think it's an important discussion to have. But when I look at Europe and I look at other places around the world, I see new parties coming in with fresh ideas and sweeping the public imagination. And I think maybe it is a new party that we need. I don't know. I just say that we need something outside the two-party system, and that is for sure. What do we do in the meantime? We support the parties, uh, the independent, the non-mainstream parties that do exist. What else do we do? We create more coalitions of coalitions. We create more uh, networks that we can have both pe people involved in independent party politics and people who are the activists on the street. Those kind of coalitions have to form. I might be a minority in this room, but I also think we have to work with people who call themselves and consider themselves progressive Democrats, uh, because I think a lot of those people have many of the same values that we uh, that we do, and we do need to work with them. I also think, see there's some, there's some of us in the room. <laughs> Didn't get a thunderous applause there, but I got a couple. Um, I also think that um, when Chris said about civil disobedience, we are not doing enough to show our opposition. I love marches. I go to marches all the time. I say a protest today keeps the doctor away. I'm always going to protest. But uh, let me tell you, walking around on a Saturday and a Sunday in a circle, coming back to the same place you started when everything else is closed, that's really not like super impactful. So uh, I would much rather see 100 people going into Congress and doing a sit-in in the lobby of the Hart Building and taping it over that building. So raise your hand if you have done civil disobedience for justice here in this room. So that should be everybody. And I would say now under Trump, it has to be all of us in this room and a whole lot more. A couple of final points I want to make. Um, one is that our wins are going to be on the local level, but we have so much, uh, not only has the right taken over the White House and the Congress, but look at two-thirds of the governorships, look at two-thirds of the legislatures, look at so many of the courts on the local level. Where are we? We have not done nearly enough. We can name a couple of cities. 
we can name some you know successes that we have at the local level but we have to do much much more at electing progressives at the local level at doing good coalition building at the local level at forcing city councils to pass resolutions from fifteen dollars an hour to sanctuary cities to say hell no to another fifty four billion dollars for the Pentagon whatever those kinds of things we have to have more and more of those that we're forcing our city councils and our mayors to do um, and I think also um, we have to, while we are taking down this system, we have to be building up the alternatives. And I'm so glad that there are so many sessions here at the Left Forum that talk about everything from worker co-ops to credit unions to public banks and all of the pieces that we're creating of a new economy. But there is also the way that we live. I always thought that living in a nuclear family was kind of a silly way to live. Um, but we have not created enough alternatives where we really have different lifestyles that are so appealing for people that no matter what their ideology is, they want to come and be in our alternative lifestyles. And it is beautiful to see out of so much of the problems in places like Detroit, those kinds of things popping up with beautiful urban gardens, with communities coming together. I'm spending more time in Miami right now because we're part of a community that's taken over a whole block in Little Haiti and is refusing gentrification and has turned it into a farm. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be and feel part of community. So we need these kind of things to keep us together, what we at Cold Pink call the local peace economy. And finally, what I want to say is that it sometimes gets very hard working in the left because it feels sometimes like a circular firing squad. <laughs> and we are constantly backbiting each other. We are constantly saying that somebody is not politically correct enough or doesn't do this enough or whatever it is. You know what we need in our movement? We need a lot more kindness. We need a lot more gentleness. We need to be a lot more loving with each other, tolerant of each other. Chris said that he has relatives who are Trump supporters. I have lots of relatives who are Trump supporters. Every time I come to New York and stay with them, it's Trump supporters. Um, I love them as well. And I work with them and I talk to them. But within even our non-Trump supporters, our community, we have to be much, much, much kinder to each other. So those are my final words. It's with love and with kindness that we will build a much stronger movement. Thank you. So it's really great to be here and to see this room really full. How many were here for this event, this panel, one year ago? This same kind of panel with many of us on it. And you know, it was a, it was a, it was a very different world a year ago. And there was so much hope and energy and effort that was being put into the Democratic Party no offense, but there was a great, uh, you know, there was a great hope out there that the Democratic Party was finally going to do it for us. And some of us did not share that point of view. That's what that panel was about a year ago. And as we approached this date, Linda and I sort of said, you know, how can we let this day come again and not take a look back and not think about did we learn anything from that experience? It, yes, it's very important that we respect each other. It's very important that we be kind with each other. But it's also very important that we recognize that the clock is ticking. And this is kind of a Hail Mary moment right now. What we went through with Bernie Sanders, Many people went through with Barack Obama. Many people went through with Dennis Kucinich. Many people went through with Jesse Jackson. Many people went through with the realignment campaign. Anybody old enough to remember the realignment campaign in the 1960s, which was where labor and the civil rights movement, two incredibly powerful movements of our time, focused their energy 
their efforts, their infrastructure on reforming the Democratic Party and creating a social democratic type Democratic Party. And you know what floundered, what that movement floundered on? The war in Vietnam, because if you were not a supporter of the war in Vietnam, you did not have the credibility to actually critique the Democratic Party. So here we are with fascism rising up a lot of places, very much in response to the neoliberalism brought to us particularly by the Clintons and the Democratic Party, also by the Republicans, but you know, it was Bill Clinton who deregulated Wall Street. It was Barack Obama who bailed it out to the tune of trillions of dollars while allowing Main Street to basically collapse. Um, we are really at the end of the road on the environment. I was reminded today of a study that came out several months ago from the World Wildlife Fund that half of the world's wildlife ha is gone. Half is gone just since 1970. You can imagine what it was going back a century. You know, we really are at the Hail Mary moment here, and we can't keep doing what we've been doing on, on nuclear weapons. You know, we are perhaps at one of the most dangerous moments ever where the Russians are moving their mobile intermediate range missiles with nuclear capacity up to the border because they've been surrounded by our missiles and our nuclear weapons over the past many decades and NATO for that matter, which promised it would not move one inch to the east of Germany at the time of German reunification. And the Russians, as you may remember from your history, have been invaded a few times, lost, you know, just a staggering number of people uh, with the invasion of the Germans and from Napoleon before that. So the Russians get a little bit defensive about being surrounded by missiles and nuclear warheads. And here we are, you know, in the midst of a new, um, what to call it, you know, a new neo-McCarthyism a new red scare, a new Russia baiting. What do we hear constantly out of Rachel Maddow and MSNBC? How the Russians are responsible for basically all the evils of the world. And, you know, this is not to say that the Russians are the good guys in white hats, you know, hardly, but rather that we are uh, making a beeline here towards oblivion, including with our nuclear weapons. And if we were engaging in Syria, as Hillary Clinton, for example, wanted us to do with a no-fly zone and be shooting down Russian airplanes, you know, would we even be here today? I don't know. Trump is horrific. And right now I am being misquoted all over the place by MSNBC. I don't know if anybody's seeing these tweets and uh, Rachel Maddow's ravings. Um, but, you know, I am being said to be responsible, actually, for all of this. <laughs> I, really, and I am so honored to be considered that powerful. Well, you're not kidding. And in fact, I now have an invitation to go on to CNN and defend myself tomorrow night. So, finally, I get to shout back. Um, you know, but it's been incredible. The nuclear issue is really serious. It cannot be overstated. And you know, that nuclear clock is like two minutes uh, from midnight right now. Uh, according to Mikhail Gorbachev, you know, the last leader of the Soviet Union, we are at the most dangerous nuclear moment ever. Um, and again, on climate, uh, Jim Hansen, the foremost climate scientist probably in the world, uh, who has never been wrong yet, is saying that it could be as soon as 2060. Got that? Not a century from now, not a thousand years from now, but as soon as 2060. Not two feet of sea level rise, but 10, 20, or 30 feet of sea level rise at the rate that the ice sheets are collapsing. So, you know, in my view, Donald Trump is not the one to be afraid of, nor is Rachel Maddow and MSNBC, or Hillary Clinton for that matter. 
What we have to be afraid of is not standing up and taking our destiny back into our own hands because we are the only ones who will save us. And I think in the same way you can say kindly and gently to a friend who is trapped in an abusive personal relationship that we got a problem here with the Democratic Party. And that this faith in the Democratic Party, the defense of the Democratic Party, is really contrary to uh, a reality check. And that was what we had in mind when we taught, at least what I had in mind, when we thought about calling this a reality check. A reality check about where do we stand in terms of our survival, in terms of fascism, the, uh, the hope that democracy will survive, that our planet will survive, that our economy will survive, that um, racial justice will somehow, you know, be, be, be resurrected out of our prison system and out of our drug wars and out of the battered economies of the African American communities, not just in this country, but all around the world. You know, we get, we've, got, we've got a critical problem here. And, and we're not gonna get out of here by running through the same paces. And for those who continue to put their hope and faith in the Democratic Party, I think, you know, in the same way, if you had a friend in an abusive relationship and their life is at risk, it's really important. You owe it to them to at least have a gentle discussion. And, you know, you can't take people where they're not gonna go, but you do owe them an honest discussion and just an honest sharing, and I think any accounting of the facts here is that we can't keep doing what we've been doing. And I think that means, you know, that doesn't make it easy. It's not easy to develop a new political party. And let me say that, you know, the Green Party I see as, as sort of the foundation because it is a national party. If you have not been involved in establishing a new national party, then you have a very rude awakening about what it is like to establish a new political party in the context of 21st century America. Everything is tilted against you. It is not easy, but we do have a very hard-won foundation which is open. It's open for joining, for discussion, even for, you know, a new name if we had to entertain. An, I mean, I find so often this boils down to the name because our agendas have actually converged. And this has been really clear over the last, I'd say, five years that our agendas have come together. We've been working together with the other socialist, progressive, peace and freedom parties. And it's hard to find the difference in terms of our agendas. There may be small differences about uh, strategy and tactics, but those get smaller by the day. So I think this is a really good news story that we have a springboard, we really have a perfect storm, and in fact, we really have no alternative. That is the only way forward uh, in which we are going to get out of here alive. And it's happening much faster than any of us would have dreamed, uh, for better and for worse. And I think Donald Trump, you know, in, in, an, in an odd and ironic way, Donald Trump is sort of the silver lining that makes us see, as Chris was saying, he is the symptom, he is not the disease, <laughs> he is the product. Remember, most people who voted for Donald Trump were not voting for him. This was shown by many studies. They weren't for him, they were against what the Democrats have to offer, which tells us. <laughs> More of the neoliberal agenda, and we saw, both by the sabotage of during Bernie Sanders, we saw by what happened at the DNC, where the reform agenda was beaten back. The ban on corporate funding was defeated, where Keith Ellison was defeated because Barack Obama created a candidate to oppose him and to push him back. And then, if that wasn't enough, then the California Democratic Party, like three weeks ago, also defeated their progressive reform candidate in the one state that really had the best organized progressive movement within the Democratic Party. How much longer are we going to wait? We got two feet over the cliff. We are in a free fall. If we get out and we organize in a social movement as well as in a political movement, we can take our future back. We can create an America and a world that works for all of us that puts people, planet, and peace over profit. 
We have the power to create that world. If we don't do it, no one will. I hope you will be a part of that fight. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for uh, being here. Um, yeah, this is a, an interesting time, if, if nothing else. Uh, we're living in a time of great contradiction. Um, Trump symbolizes many of those. Uh, but the world is in, his, he's president because of these crises. Uh, the crisis of legitimacy, which delegitimized elite consensus which is why they go on and on about fake news, because people are clearly, for many reasons, not believing it anymore. But the crisis is economic. Uh, the capitalist system is under great stress. Um, it provides fewer and fewer benefits to the masses of people. Uh, it's on its last legs, but that is um, also what makes it so dangerous. And it explains everything from the uh, Brexit vote to the um, heightened imperialist imper imperative. It explains the whipped up frenzy of Russophobia and the attacks on a right wing president by the elites and by the deep state. Um, ever since uh, Trump took uh, the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement two days ago, and we've been hearing a lot of, and we should, uh, about the danger of. Uh, environmental collapse and even mass extinction. But at the same time, I think we need to point out that this Paris Agreement was not everything that we were told that it was. Of course, I don't agree with Trump that climate change is, uh, is a hoax. Uh, I don't think having a green economy is go uh, gonna hurt the economy or hurt workers. But it was, it's also true that the accord was a ruse by which the rich countries um, gave the appearance of doing something about climate change when they were not. Uh, just to mention just one problematic aspect of the agreement, it actually permitted the world temperature to rise even more. So here we are, we're trying to escape all the traps and all the contradictions that go along with them. Uh, the political trap that we live with uh, here in the United States is this two-party duopoly of the Republicans and the uh, Democrats. And what we have in essence is one far right party and one center right party. And uh, the system is set up to exclude third parties or to relegate them to uh, irrelevancy or even spoiler uh, status. I personally know people who want to uh, vote green but they were afraid to. But these people, they don't need convincing. They know the Democrats are, do very little on our behalf. Um, for black voters, the choices are particularly stark. We're in this trap within a trap uh, because our system always has, uh, historically, one party is the party for white people. And for the past 50 years, that's been uh, Republicans. So uh, we've been, we're very risk averse. Uh, so much so that um, uh, most black people would not think about uh, uh, supporting Bernie Sanders. There was a fairly large cohort, cohort of younger people, younger generations were more willing. But in general, and I don't believe that's because people hated him or anything, there was just this fear to stick with the tried and true and uh, defeat the Republicans, which didn't happen anyway. But um, so here we are. Uh, so what do we do on the left at this moment? But I, I, not to oversimplify, because this is all very complicated and difficult, but I think it's important just to be on the left. No prefixes. People want to be alt left. Somebody told me about pop left. I'm like, just left. Just leave it alone. Did I do that? No, no. I didn't someone leaned on the light. Oh. Could, could someone uh, lean back and fix it? OK. So right wing controls the electricity. Okay. We're just trying to make it more intimate. So if you open the door. Yeah, open the door so you can see. You can see what you're doing. Yeah. What about the other side? This is, it's a very dramatic. But now we have a screen. <laughs> Okay, so it stops. 
what a dramatic moment for me. Um, so at any rate, where was I? Yes, yes, White People's Party. So Democrats are seen as the only game in town um, that keep the even worse barbarians outside of the gate. Um, and I, I say that I say that we should just uh, assert our leftness, despite the challenges presented by the duopoly. And I don't think we should shrink from uh, hurting a party which already has hurt itself, and which needs, uh, frankly, to be hurt some more. So Trump's victory presents presents us with an opportunity. On uh, election night, when I it was about 10:30 Eastern time, and I realized, oh my God, she's going to lose. Um, I, I had to rewrite my, like many other people, I had to rewrite my black agenda <laughs> for a column. Um, uh, but her defeat was actually, when I think about it, not surprising. This was a culmination of years of Democratic Party losses. Uh, the last success was 2008. Obama sweeps in with Democratic control of uh, the House and the Senate. But their only signature achievement, and the one thing that everybody shoved in your face if you dared question them, but Obamacare, what about Obamacare? which could be gotten rid of anyway. Um, but, uh, and I'm not gonna say it didn't do anything. It was especially important in those states that accepted the Medicaid funding. Um, but it also enshrined reliance on the for-profit system, which is the cause of all our healthcare problems. And uh, so most voters want Medicare for all. That's what people want. There's no, there's no mystery to how the Democrats can win again. Raise the minimum wage. They raised it, they controlled everything. It could have been what they wanted it to be. And they raised it 70 cents an hour, I believe it was. Card check, does anybody remember card check? Yeah. Well, if you don't remember, it's okay because it didn't happen. <laughs> um, and so the last victory was Obama's reelection. And they've gone on to lose more and more and more across the country. And it's clear that their only plan is to win the presidency and cut deals with Republicans. And uh, for that meager effort, we're told to be grateful. And then, of course, they couldn't even get that right. So um, when I, and in inevitably we are always, asked about uh, lesser evilism. Um, well, first of all, the Democrats can't even win anymore. So it's hard to be the lesser evil when you can't even get into office <laughs> and do a little bit. So. At this point, uh, supporting them for that reason is selling your soul literally for nothing at all. Um, we do have to, yes, uh, acknowledge how our system diminishes the role of third parties, but I say put the Democrats out of their misery. Um, we could be the second party. They, they can't be reformed because they don't want to be. And they uh, can't even win and provide the illusion of working on our behalf. So, but here we are since November, and they're not going quietly. There's been very little discussion of the analysis of Trump's victory. Um, we're told Vladimir Putin is to blame, unless he told Hillary Clinton, no, nah, you got Wisconsin and Michigan, Pennsylvania, you don't have to show up. So unless he did that, you can't blame him. Um, the FBI director, Comey, I believe, was covering himself because he knew she was in serious legal jeopardy. But uh, I believe things had already been settled, frankly, by that time. So the Democrats are the problem them, themselves. And they've lived off this undeserved uh, reputation for years and years. And the less and less they do, the fewer votes they get. And they uh, don't give people what they want because they're captured by corporate interests. So if you provide Medicare for all, you don't get the money from Big Pharma and the insurance companies. If you um, advocate for a higher minimum wage, then that costs big business money. And that's why they don't do it. They hope that Republicans will be unpopular or, you know, we'll just tell people how bad Trump is and then we can get back in. Um, but they wouldn't even go through the motions of uh, supporting some part of Bernie Sanders' uh, policy. Uh, they, in, uh, Jill referenced the DNC chairmanship race and Keith Ellison who, uh, instead of supporting him, and just to be politically cynical, say, well, we'll make it look like we're, you know, we're doing something for Bernie's people. Nope, they went and found Tom Perez and uh, created this candidacy so he could try to keep selling what people weren't buying. But, uh, but that is where, why we are where we are now. Um, the bloom was already off the rose, 
And, uh, but despite having raised a billion dollars, am I the only one who says, if you have a billion dollars, how do you lose? Has anybody else <laughs> had that thought? What was she paying for? Nobody, you know, they had some logarithm or algorithm which said, ah, you got this state, you got that state, you don't have to go. Anyway, but um, so here we are now. Um, and uh, so Trump, the elephant in the room, the guy who, it's hard, you can't ignore him when he's, you know, when he's not shoving the president of Montenegro, he's got <laughs> tweets with typos and his dumb son-in-law is running foreign policy. There's always something. <laughs> And you can't take your eyes off of him, and it's hard for, uh, for him to be uh, ignored. But he's going to be the president until January 2021. I don't think he's going to be impeached. The Republicans would have to be the ones who want to do that. He'd have to be a true liability to them. And I don't think the Democrats want him. They want to run against him. And he's their fundraising and vote-getting poster child. But um, so here we are. Uh, again, where we were in uh, 2001, and uh, as I've said, we need to be unapologetic about where we are and uh, keep building our movement. And it's time, I spoke of crises, but um, it, creating a crisis is also a good thing. That is how um, uh, movements are successful. If you think about uh, the 60s, and the uh, liberation movement, the so-called civil rights movement, succeeded. I mean, just think about it. Black people got the right to vote when most black people lived in the South and could not vote. Uh, this was, is what a mass movement can do. And it was, um, it's hard. It's been a long time since people have uh, seen this in action. So it will be difficult, but not impossible. And uh, there was no compromise, as there is now. There was debate. Should we confront Lyndon Johnson? He's already done so much for us. Can we? People wanted to confront Dr. King. There were differences in strategy. But there was always somebody who did it. And no one just said it's a lesser evil or you can't say anything about this one or that one. People stepped forward. And that is what uh, we have to keep doing uh, now. So, but it's been a long time, as I said. And now that all that uh, energy, the um, environmental movement, uh, people, Nixon did not create the EPA because he wanted to. There was a huge movement, uh, a huge campaign against uh, Congress members called the Dirty Dozen, and a lot of them lost. And he got the message and we got an EPA. So those are the things that we have to remember about what we did and what other people did before us. Um, so here we are with Trump, but I think it's important not to be you know, it's unfortunate that presentation is everything. And Obama could deport people, but he's Obama and very polished. And uh, he's nice to his wife in public, and he's not pushing anybody around or doing anything crazy. Um, so, uh, so we accept, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had him again? Or what, I don't know what the, the substantive, I'm not saying there are no substantive differences. But there aren't enough for people to just uh, fold their tents and act as though uh, the Democrats, uh, that we should want them to be back in office. And I, I'd like to talk about something else. Um, I know my time is short. About um, uh, election integrity, about voter suppression. Uh, Hillary Clinton lost key states, I'm sure of it, because of voter suppression. But she has said nothing about, she finally did a couple days ago. She and other Democrats, the Congressional Black Caucus, have said nothing about that. And uh, John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, civil rights icon, I don't know how you get designated that, but he said <laughs> Trump was not the legitimate president and when asked why, did he say it was because of voter suppression? No. Did he say it's because of voter ID laws? No. Did he say it's because of the Electoral College? Nope. He said it's because of Russia. And um, <laughs> he and the rest of the Congressional Black Caucus don't even talk about black people anymore. So this is, this is where we are now. And that, I believe, makes the case for uh, not apologizing by uh, cutting them loose and by working um, uh, together by running candidates for office. I don't think we really have a choice. Uh, we live in a world where eight billionaires have as much money as half the poor people, something like that. And um, uh, the climate crisis, which is real and severe, 
uh, which is going to continue even if the United States stayed in uh, that, um, that uh, uh, climate pact. So I say we have to stand our ground and stay the course and keep doing what we've been doing. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to our panelists. We'll hear a little bit more from them uh, before we end. But while you're passing your questions down, uh, I'm Linda Thompson's just going to take a minute to tell you a little bit about Left Elect. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to start by taking a little poll. How many people here would like a third mass working class party? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, second question. How many people are actively trying to build one? Okay, that's about a quarter of the people who want it. You're not the only ones who want one. Years ago, there was an AARP poll which said incredibly that about 70% of people in the United States want a third party. And yet here we are without one. And there's a reason for that. It's a reason is that the left has lost confidence in itself. We have been brainwashed to believe that we cannot do it. So left elect came into being to begin that discussion of not just dreaming about one, not just talking about one, but beginning to not build, but lay the basis for building a third party. And what we did was draw together all the independent campaigns left of the Democratic Party around the country and it was a very broad coalition that came into being, including Socialists, the Green Party, people who ran on their own as independents. And we held a conference in Chicago in May of 2015. And let me tell you, for having a coalition of left parties and individuals, it was a wonderfully collaborative affair. And People were working together. There were deep discussions exploring this dilemma that we find ourselves in of not having this mass party that we so badly need in this country. Mm -hmm.